me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ola Tui, who is consultant urologist at Queen Alexandra Hospital in Portsmouth and Southampton General Hospital, who is going to talk about the what some of us have been really asking for for a long time, but the DMTs and the ageing MS patients and what we need to know in clinical practice. So welcome. Thanks, Thank you. So Thanks for the invitation to speak. And I suppose my one disclosure is that I've actually moved location since I was invited to talk. And I've moved from the NHS back to Ireland. So working in a, a different health system with a, a different set of challenges. Um, but the, the topic is still, is still the same. Um, oh, I can. So again, I, this, you can clearly see this slide was put, put in this morning. So I've no disclosures. And I, you know, there are more than two words on, on some of the next slides. So when I was, I was asked to give this talk, I suppose I had to, to go and do my homework because if you'd asked me to, to pick a figure out of the air for what proportion of our, of our MS patients are over a certain age, I guess that I've been plucking figures out of, out of the air. Um, and it's interesting when you do look at, at, at the data. So Public Health England have, you know, have issued their own demographic data, you know, showing that the you know, over a quarter of, of our MS patients are over the age of, of 65, which was sort of the, the traditional retirement age. So I think it's higher than, than I would have expected. And I suppose that's probably, you know, due to some of the biases that working in, in hospital medicine, perhaps the patients that you see in clinic tend to be younger, recently are newly diagnosed. But I guess the experience of, of nurses in the community is different, where you, you know, you're dealing with, with a lot of these, you know, older patients day to day. Um, and I think, you know, with the advent of, of disease-modifying <coughs> therapies that are now licensed for using in progressive MS, I think we've all had to become more aware of the, the needs and the expectations, I suppose, of, of, of older patients. Um, again, just to, to make sure that, that I trusted that previous slide, that the, the data was, was accurate, I went and looked at the MS, the MS Trust and the MS Society figures. And again, it seems to all tie up using different different data sources, it seems to be that a quarter of our patients are in this, in this over 65 age category. So when I was a, a medical student, which was still in this century, just about, um, MS was painted to us as a disease. It was very black and white. Um, it, on one side, you had younger patients who had inflammatory MS with relapsing, remitting disease course. And, and these were the patients that there were treatments available for. There weren't many. Um, you know, I think beta interferon would have been would have been about it. But again, there was sort of optimism that there were treatments that could be offered. And then on the other side, there was older patients who were more likely to be in the progressive phase of multiple sclerosis. And the pathological correlate of this progressive phase was of loss of axons and of neurodegeneration. So you almost had it in the same category as these other neurodegenerative conditions that you learned about, such as Parkinson's or you know, Alzheimer's, where we didn't have anything to, to reverse the damage that was being done. And so it was sort of a, a, bit, a bit sobering and a bit despondent when, you know, when you, when you considered patients in those later stages of, of MS. Um, but I think, you know, with everything in life, the picture is a bit more complicated than that, and, and it's not all black and white, and there's, there's many shades of grey. So I think some of those rules that I accepted as dogma as a medical student aren't actually through and the fact of us being able to separate inflammation and degeneration you know I think we, we, we now know that there's good evidence that, that they're not separate processes and we can see this from from pathology studies and again this mix of pinks and purples is a, a picture of a, a, a pathology slide from from an MS brain um, and what you can see is a sort of those darker purple dots and those are inflammatory cells or cells of the immune system that are, that are attacking the, the, the nervous system um, in an MS brain. And there have been studies that have shown that even in patients with the progressive form of MS that you still find active inflammatory lesions. Um, and actually in, in, in the majority of patients with progressive MS in, in these studies there were active lesions despite them being within the, the progressive stages of MS. So this gives us hope that you know, there, there is the opportunity to maybe intervene with treatments that target the immune system uh, and to somehow improve the situation for these patients. This study is often referred to as, as, as showing that you know, in, a, in a very older cohort of MS patients that perhaps the disease burns out and so there isn't maybe anything, anything that 
get, that can be done or, or any role for treatment. But actually, just reading the small print of the paper, they did report that there were some subtle changes between the, the MS brains of these patients where they didn't have the traditional active lesions, but there were still signs of the immune system being active in a different way in the linings or the meninges of the brain. And it's often thought that perhaps this is a reason why, even if the immune system is still active in the, in the, the later stages of the disease, that perhaps it's been sealed off from the, the peripheral immune system. And that's one theory as to why anti-inflammatories or immune modulatory treatments aren't effective in their current form, that they can't get into the, into the site of action. Um, so like the, like the rest of our body, I suppose our, our immune system isn't... Um, isn't immune to the effects of age, so our skin wrinkles, our, our muscles shrink, and there are other changes then that happen in, in our immune system. And there's two sort of buzzwords that seem to be common if you do a literature search on the immune system and aging, and they are immunosenescence and, and inflammaging. And immunosenescence, I like to you know, use the analogy of a car, so I think in the, in the picture here we see a car that's probably seen better days. Um, and if we think of our immune system as like this car, again, it's not the most efficient in terms of the engine in a, a newer, newer model can get from zero to 60 quicker, can probably uh, go further on a, on a full tank of petrol or diesel or an electric charge um, as opposed to this car. So our immune system doesn't operate as efficiently and there's you know, reasons why that is. We're less able to respond to a wider range of pathogens. So Older people are more susceptible to infections. Um, they don't respond as well to vaccines and their immune system mightn't do an, as effective a job in, in doing the surveillance function that's needed to detect cancers and, and to fight them. So again, cancers are, are commoner in older people. Then the other, the other term, inflammaging, is, is a process whereby, although the immune system isn't as active, it's still doing something and secreting harmful molecules, if you like. And that's because our, our immune system is less effective in, in, in older age at shutting down harmful function and getting rid of these inefficient cells that are sort of active in a low-grade fashion and doing some harm. Um, and we've lost the ability to effectively clear them. So they're there continuously causing low-grade levels of, of inflammation. And this is thought you know, to be one explanation for why older people are at more risk of certain autoimmune diseases, such as rheumatological diseases, um, as they age. Now, disease-modifying therapies, I suppose, have, have come to dominate you know, a lot of our discussions and consultations, and I suppose we're biased towards looking at the effects of disease-modifying therapy, and, and, and they've been most satisfying to use in, in the people they're more effective in, which is younger people, earlier on in, in the stages of MS. Um, I, I put these graphs in... Oh, sorry. Put these graphs in just to, to demonstrate, I suppose, what this is a, a meta-analysis that someone did where they collected loads of data on, on clinical trial outcomes in patients and all, practically all the trials they could find where disease-modifying therapy was trialled and they broke it down into, into age groups, so age is along this axis here. And again, 55 tends to be the upper limit of, of patients who are included in, in trials of disease-modifying therapies. And we can see that the the, the other axis then is grading how the effect of the treatment is in preventing disability progression. So I suppose where you want to be is up here really high. You want to have an effective treatment that offers you here an 80% chance of preventing you accumulating disability. And we can see that that's alemtuzumab or one of the, the more effective inductive treatments that's available. And then yellow is ocrelizumab. So I think it's interesting just to compare ocrelizumab, so the effect, how effective it is in preventing disability progression it's much more impressive in the younger patients as opposed to even coming, you know, 10 years along the line. It's, it's definitely less effective in, in reducing disability progression. And similarly for natalizumab or, or tisabri, which we know is highly effective in younger pa patients and unfortunately not, not as effective then when you, when you get on in age. Um, and I think the MS world has sort of grasped the take-home message that was... That was you know, given from this meta-analysis, which is, you know, the more powerful treatments are more effective in younger patients and when started early. Um, and I think everyone is, is aware of that. And, you know, we're all eager to start younger, newly diagnosed patients and to get them on the most effective treatment possible to hopefully prevent them, you know, accumulating disability in, in the long term. 
Um, but then again, I think you know the, the neglected group in terms of MS management seems to be older older people. They're excluded from clinical trials, I suppose, because there's less chance of, of being able to demonstrate that there's a treatment effect and, and get a drug licensed. Um, and even the patients who are then included in the trials, they they tend to be maybe not the typical patients that you'll come across in clinic. They tend to be relatively healthy otherwise, not have diabetes or heart disease or any other. <coughs> comorbidities that potentially could influence the, the result of a trial. And also the way the trials are designed. So traditionally an MS clinical trial is run over two or three years. Um, the kind of outcomes that you want to be measuring to show an effect are things like relapses. And again, knowing that a lot of older people are going to be in a progressive phase of their multiple sclerosis. These aren't the, the kind of outcomes that these trials are, are designed for. And also the biases I think that we've, we've discussed previously that you know, EDSS-based disability outcomes aren't ideal for, particularly for patients who are in the more advanced stages of MS, where they're going to be sitting at EDSS 6 for a couple of years rather than, than the, their EDSS score changing, you know, within a, within a two to three year time frame. So you might not necessarily be able to pick up any treatment effects. And so we need to look at better outcome measures, for example, assessing cognition and, and upper limb function uh, and perhaps, you know, perhaps swaying more towards using composite endpoints, looking at different aspects of, of what progression is, is in MS. A lot of the um, data then, if you're looking to support using disease-modifying therapy in older people, so data that is useful is, is data that comes from MS registers. So, you know, the, there's international MS registers, such as MS base, and then different countries have their own registers. And so you can often come across you know, registers from different countries where perhaps they've been able to treat people on a, a compassionate basis who might have progressive MS and get some data as to whether the treatments are effective that way. And this is just an example of an Italian MS register where they've been quite good in, in collecting their data. And they looked at people with primary progressive MS who would have fitted the criteria for the oratorio story, study, which was the primary progressive ocrelizumab trial. And they did see, although the data is messy and it's a statistician's nightmare and that there's lots of biases in it, there did seem to be a treatment effect, you know, even in, in people who, who did have primary progressive MS. And again, I know it wasn't your, your favourite outcome there, but EDSS 7 are of, you know, be, you know, becoming wheelchair bound that, you know, I think, you know, I'd, this data is useful in showing that DMTs do, do do something and they do affect real world outcomes as well. So an overview of a disease-modifying therapy in ageing patients, just taking those previous slides as a backdrop to it. You know, in, in, what are we going to be looking at when, when we're talking about disease-modifying therapy in older patients? And in some people, we're going to be starting them de novo on a disease-modifying therapy, and particularly over recent years when ocrelizumab for primary progressive MS and saponamod have come online. There's patients who, who are treatment naive who are looking to be starting on a disease-modifying therapy for the first time. And so it's very important to be able to counsel those patients, you know, what do the drugs do and what would we expect them to do? And also to, to make them aware of the side effects and, and trying to do that difficult balancing act of trying to assess what the benefit versus the risk might be in, in each individual. I think it's, it's difficult not to do a discussion on disease modifying therapy in, in older patients without talking about or touching on stopping disease modifying therapy and when or if that is ever ever appropriate to do. So I think I have a couple of slides on, on that as well. Um, I think everyone here is probably familiar with ocrelizumab and has seen some of these you know, types of graphs presented in, in, in one form or other. Um, so ocrelizumab is, a, I suppose, a monoclonal antibody that was the first drug that was licensed for treating primary progressive MS. So it was a big milestone, uh, I think, for patients in particular when this was, was licensed because for once there seemed to be some hope on the horizon for them that they were now eligible for, for disease-modifying therapy that previously had only been available for pe people who had relapsing forms of MS. It's often difficult, and I find it a challenge in, in clinic when, you know, when you're trying to have a discussion with the, with the patient, particularly someone who hasn't been on disease-modifying therapy in the past and, and who might be you know, older in age and trying to you know, counsel them about what you expect the treatment to do. Because I think we're, we're used to, you know, having discussions with, with patients or to giving them figures for what we expect a, a disease-modifying therapy to do in relapsing MS. So we'll say, you know, they, 
the least effective treatments reduce your risk of a relapse by 30%, whereas the most effective ones at 70 to 80%. But the discussion is quite different when it comes to you know, explaining what these drugs potentially do for people. Um, I often revert back to describing the clinical trials and trying to give you know, figures which may or may not be useful, but just saying you know, in this trial, for example, they compared 100 people who had primary progressive MS like you have and 100 people uh, and put 100 of them on treatment and, and 100 of them didn't get a treatment. And then they assessed, checked them out every three months and found that 39% um, you know, uh, of people who didn't get any treatment seemed to increase in disability, whereas only 33% in the group who were on the treatment um, progressed. Again, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to, I suppose, counsel patients in that, you know, if they ask you on an individual basis, do you think it will work for me? I think that's, that's always difficult. And so, you know, you're, 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 I suppose you're giving them information that based on group data rather than, than on individual prognosticators or individual um, factors that might indicate whether they'd respond well to treatment or not. So Panama then is the other one, you know, the other specific drug that I just wanted to mention because again, it's fairly recently licensed and was unfortunate in the sense that it was licensed and then COVID hit. So I think it, it, it was sort of delayed in terms of its use. Um, again, this was again tried in, in patients who had secondary progressive MS, so who were going to be that older. Um, but again, you know, if you were to break down the trial data, again, you can see that the patients who were actually included in the, in the, in the study, that they weren't necessarily what we might consider old. You know, I think, don't think anyone would, would say that 48 is particularly old. And so you need to be aware of that when you're, you know, if you're someone who's 70 coming to you saying, well, you know, the, these were the results from that trial, you might, you know, have to discuss with them, well, you know, it, it might be that you're not typical of the, of the people that were included in that trial for, for this reason, perhaps. Um, but nonetheless, it's, you know, it's, it's a drug that patients are interested in and interested in discovering if they're, if they're eligible for it. And I think, you know, I think all MS services have found that they've had lots of queries from, from, from people as to whether they might be candidates. And that's thrown up its own challenges. For example, someone who might not have been under regular follow-up for, for a decade and then comes back into the system particularly if you're, you're, you're trying to look for radiological activity, for example, and they haven't had a, had a scan in 10 years. Um, again, saponamide is a drug, I suppose, everyone needs to go through a pre-assessment process for it. And again, particularly in, in, in older people, you're going to need to see have they any of the cardiac contraindications to using it. So it, it does take a bit of time and it is a process to go through, you know, the, the risks and the potential benefits. And you will find that older people perhaps more likely to have the cardiac disease or, or the you know, eye, eye contraindications or cautions about treatment. Again, you know, focusing on, on sort of age again, um, this is a, a subgroup analysis. Again, the trial wasn't powered to look at subgroups, but um, often you, you can see in the appendix to the trials that they do publish data. And this is just breaking down the effect of saponamide in that trial, that clinical trial that led to it being licensed for secondary progressive MS. And just looking that there seemed to be a trend that, you know, older patients, that the effect of treatment, you know, lessened uh, the older you got. This line here would be the line that there would be no effect of the treatment. And the further you, the, the, the um, diamond is, the more effective the treatment is likely to be. So we can see that there is that that line going from the, the younger age groups towards the older age groups where the effects seem to, seem to dissipate a little and where the confidence intervals crossed, crossed that line. So, you know, we can, I suppose that the, the efficacy data is somewhat sobering in terms, there seems to be the signal there that the older you are, the less effective the treatment it is, but Again, I think if someone's eligible for it, then they should be offered the, the treatment and you just need to make them aware, I suppose, that it might not be, you know, a wonder treatment. Then th that needs to be, you know, weighed up against the, the risk of adverse effects. Um, some of the real side effects that we as, as neurologists and I suppose as nurses and things worry about things like PML, older people are going to be at, at, at higher risk of those more serious and, and side effects that keep us awake at night, for example, PML and, and cancers. And this, this um, slide is just from a study which shows that, again, those, those kind of nasty side effects, particularly with the high efficacy treatments, that they tend to be commoner or, or more frequent in older people. 
you know, things like shingles um, have traditionally happen in, in older people anyway. Um, older people tend to be more at risk at PML, perhaps because their immune system isn't as, as robust and they're more likely to perhaps been, have been exposed to, to JC virus along their life course. And also, you know, opportunistic infections um, are, are commoner in older people, particularly when you, when you combine it with the effect of a, a drug that has a powerful effect on the immune system. PML, I suppose, is the, is the one that we all fear. Um, um, again, Tysabri is the, the drug that's been associated more strongly with PML. And, you know, I think we are seeing that there are an increasing proportion of older people who are now on Tysabri. They've started it, you know, 10 or 20 years ago and they've remained on it because it's been so effective for them. Um, and patients are often reluctant to come off it, despite you know, knowing that they are potentially in the higher risk of category in terms of, of getting PML. Um, studies of PML that's developed in, in MS patients have shown that um, age is one of the risk factors for doing badly from, from PML. So you know, you're more likely to die or to be severely disabled if you're over 50 and, and you get PML. Um, I think it was last year, I think, that the... the the case report of the, I suppose the first case report of PML in an MS patient on oculizumab came out and, and I think this sort of heightened our awareness of, you know, of, of PML in, in oculizumab. I suppose what's, you know, interesting about that case in, in that patient who was on oculizumab monotherapy for primary progressive MS where they, they were probably a bit older than we'd be comfortable using oculizumab within this country. Uh, and if you look back at their blood counts before they were started on treatment, they already had a, a, a lymphopenia before they even started on treatment, suggesting they mightn't have the, the most robust immune system to start with. Um, so it's just, I suppose, a note of caution. It just you know, makes you think perhaps this person wasn't the, the best candidate for, for, for starting on, on ocrelizumab. Again, it's hard to do an MS talk nowadays. We're talking about the, the big C, which, which has become COVID. Um, you know, COVID happened and it stopped all of us in our tracks. And it, I know certainly it made me think a lot harder about, about my treatment decisions and about, you know, starting, starting people on more powerful treatments and being more, I suppose, more conscious of the risks. Um, and I think going forward, touch wood or whatever is close to wood next to me, um, you know, potentially we're, we're over the worst of COVID now and we, ha we have vaccines and, and, and we understand a bit more about it. But there is always the risk in the future that there will be, you know, future infectious diseases, COVID variants or, or, or different viruses that will make our, you know, that potentially our MS patients will be, will be more vulnerable to severe infection or to, to, to worse outcomes if they are exposed to, to these viruses and, and they're on these, these powerful immune suppressing treatments. The other issue, I suppose, that, you know, that we're all dealing with day to day is questions surrounding vaccination um, and, and, and whether the timing of getting your COVID vaccine and, and also learning that patients on certain of these disease modifying therapies and in particular the ones that we're using for progressive forms of MS, that they seem to be associated with a reduced response to, to, to COVID vaccines. And I think the, the you know, you know, while a patient might say to you, well, you know, I'm, I'm willing to take the risk, you know, if I can, if I can get on the treatment, I suppose, you know, there's all the knock on effects of, uh, you know, of things like COVID on, on people being socially isolated and becoming deconditioned and, and just deteriorating because of the public health measures that, that are in place because of COVID. And, and so if, you know, if you have someone who's elderly and who's on ocrelizumab and they're in this highly vulnerable patient category that we used to refer to, you're going to be advising that person to stay indoors, not to, not to socialise. And, and you have to kind of consider the effects that that will have on them, uh, both on their, their mental and physical health. This is, a, you know, a slide that shows the, the effect of the, the different MS disease modifying therapies on the risk of, risk of death from, from COVID. And we, again, we can kind of see fairly consistent signals that come out that the, the anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies here seem to be associated with a higher risk of you know, of doing badly if you do contract COVID. Um, and I think we, you know, we don't have a lot of data on some of the, 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 newer, the newer treatments, but um, certainly that anti-CD20 signal seems to be out there. And not only for doing, doing worse if you do contract COVID, but also for not being able to, to respond as effectively, uh, you know, to, to the vaccines that are available for, for COVID. 
I'll try and, and get through this section quickly in the interest of time. So discontinuing disease modifying therapy has always been a, a, a difficult discussion. Um, perhaps it's made a little bit easier nowadays by, by the, having saponamod available as a treatment option for patients who are in that secondary progressive phase of their disease where you're not going to be saying to them, well, we just have to stop your, your, your treatment because your, your disability is progressing. progressing. You're able to, to say to them there is potentially another treatment option that might be more effective than, than what you're on already. Um, the MS base, which is that use international registry data of, of MS patients, um, they were able to get um, you know, a, a cohort of patients together who stopped d their disease modifying therapies um, and compare them to then a similar matched group of patients who, who stayed on their DMTs. Now, this included patients of all ages, so it's not just older patients. Um, and they were patients who were, who were relapse free for a five year period of time. And they, the outcomes that they looked at were, you know, the risk of relapse after you stop treatment versus staying on it and the risk of your disability progression, pr progressing. Um, and they saw that, that well, the, the risk of having a relapse wasn't different between the, the patients who stopped or, st who, or who stayed on treatment. That actually, you were more likely to progress in terms of your disability if you, if you stopped treatment. And, and the take home message from this was that there's potentially patients who are on you know, injectables or on beta interferon who they're not having relapses at the same time their disability isn't changing. And perhaps that's because they're responding to treatment rather than that the treatment isn't, isn't doing anything. Because occasionally patients do come to you and they say, well, I've been on this, it's a bit of a hassle to inject it, is it actually doing anything? So data like this is able to tell you that potentially you are a, a responder to the treatment and that's, not why, that's why you're not getting worse and, and there will be a risk to, to discontinuing it. Um, and again, I suppose the same signals emerged from this data as well. The risk of you progressing was higher if you were an older patient uh, and the risk of you having a relapse was, was higher if you were younger. I suppose what's more um, relevant to, to this talk is, is this trial, which was a randomized clinical trial that was done in the, the United States, looking at an older patient cohort who'd, who'd um, been relapse-free for five years. Again, the majority of them were on injectables on beta interferon or glutarimer acetate, but they were an average age of 63, so sort of representative of you know, patients that are maybe coming to clinic asking you, you know, do I need to stay on treatment or, or, or should I come off it? Um, the, the numbers weren't huge, there were about 130 in the treatment arm versus the placebo arm, um, and, and that being the patients who stayed on treatment versus those who came off it. So they didn't demonstrate you know, that coming off treatment wasn't inferior to staying on it, but there did seem to be a signal emerging that there was a difference between the two groups and that those who stopped treatment, although they didn't relapse or have any increase in their disability, that they did seem to develop new, new MRI lesions when they were scanned. So this suggests that you know, even treatments like beta interferon and glutarimer acetate are potentially doing something in older patients who, who haven't you know, actively been relapsing over recent years and that there is potentially value to, to continuing them. Um, this is a slide then looking at you know, risk tolerance in people with MS, because I think this is something that we perhaps neglect a little bit. We have our own concept of what risk is, and we're, you know, in, in general, I think as neurologists, when, when we're compared to other specialists, anecdotally meant to be very risk averse, and we worry a lot about side effects of, of treatment. Um, so this study was, again, from the US, but they did survey over 3,000 patients and just gave them a hypothetical scenario, having a disease modifying therapy that reduced the risk of them relapsing by 50% and reduced the risk of their disability progressing by 30%. And then it gave them six possible side effects of that treatment. And they were asked to, to give a figure as to how, you know, how tolerant they would be of a risk, for example, of one in a thousand or of one in a hundred thousand. Um, and I suppose the, the risks that across the board people were less tolerant of were you know, PML and, and kidney injury, which, which sort of makes sense. They're the ones that we, we worry most about as well. Um, but I, what I found interesting was that the, the, you know, the characteristics that defined how tolerant you were of risk or how inclined you were to, to be a, more of a risk taker, um, I would perhaps have, have thought that maybe older people would be, would be more willing to take a, a risk in, in that, you know, if they are in the progressive phase of AMS and they're 
they haven't been offered any treatment before that perhaps they'd be more willing to you know to take a, a riskier treatment um but the results were the were the converse it tends to be younger people and again i, I guess this fi fits with that phenotype of the young male sort of risk taker um but it yeah. and it, but again those with more advanced disability again again who might be be older were um were accepting of higher risks um, but but interestingly older age wasn't one of the one of the the factors associated with being a risk taker. So again, you know, disease modifying therapy in, in older patients, like a lot of things, I don't think there's a wrong or right answer. I think it's a very individualized decision and, and the discussions and, and with patients are challenging and, and are difficult and they do have to be very individualized, taking into account how effective the treatment is likely to be while acknowledging that we don't have very good individual level prognosticators for, for how effective the treatment is, is going to be. Um, we have group data, we have clinical trial um, results, but, but for that individual in, in front of you, it can often be difficult to, to estimate how, how, how they will respond to, to treatment and also to communicate that to them. Um, and again, patient preference and their risk tolerance, I think, is if they're eligible for a treatment, then those are going to be the, the two most important factors that will, that will determine the decision. So I suppose the take home message is, you know, disease modifying therapies in aging patients. We have options that weren't there before and now that we've treatments licensed for progressive MS. But disease modifying therapies are just one, one piece in the bigger jigsaw puzzle of, of managing people with with, with MS, with progressive MS and with, with older patients. And there's all these other interventions that you know, we wish we had more time in the consultations to, to focus on. For example, optimizing brain health and stressing the importance of social interactions and physical activity. Um, and also the, you know, the, the effect of managing particularly troublesome symptoms. I think we saw that in the symposium earlier on today, where even for a young person with early, early MS that they can have symptoms that are really disabling such as urinary symptoms and you know unpleasant sensory symptoms that can interfere with sleep and and for example sorting out someone's bladder with um, with bladder training or with a with a prescription medication can often be be transformative for them and perhaps have a bigger impact than than maybe some of these disease modifying therapies i think that's it for me